It's so good to see you. Uh, grateful for those who have led us in our worship thus far. Uh, grateful for you. Uh, if you're visiting with us, I've had the pleasure to meet Sean and Tabitha, and I see that there are others, and we just want you to feel welcome. Uh, we want you to know that you are highly esteemed and honored guests. Uh, if you have your Bibles open to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, before I go on, I want to say I'm grateful to be back home. <laughs> it's good to be back with the saints here at Chesapeake. But as we think about Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, uh, I want us to spend some time considering the fact uh, this morning uh, that God is able. God is able. The inadequacy of mankind has been likened to a tiny babe learning to walk uh, who is able to stand up, but only as he is held by the hand. And such is used to impress upon our minds the idea, the reality, that if God does not hold us up, we will faint. If God does not hold us up as human beings, we will utterly Fail. Yes, you see, you and I, no matter how uh, much we may get this fact twisted, uh, you and I are not self-sufficient. We're not. You and I are not all-knowing. You see, we do not have nor exercise absolute sovereignty. We uh, are not all-powerful. There are some things that are simply beyond our ability to do. And it's only when man faces and admits his extreme weakness and limitation that he understands truly the need uh, to depend on an almighty God whose capability and whose power is matchless. I'm telling you, God is able this morning. Now, we think about the book of Ephesians. We'll spend some time there. In the book of Ephesians, it's been said, uh, was written to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Christ, but they are living as beggars only because they are ignorant of the wealth that is truly theirs in Christ. And so as the Apostle Paul opens up the epistles in chapter, this epistle, excuse me, in chapters one through three, uh, he begins to enumerate, he begins to describe some of the contents of the Christian spiritual bank account. Uh, he'll talk about things like adoption or being accepted by God. He'll talk about redemption and forgiveness and an inheritance. He'll talk about the fact of us being sealed with the Holy Spirit. He'll talk about hope and life and grace and salvation, citizenship. In essence, he's heavily helping them to understand, along with you and I, that they have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, in verses, chapters 4 through 6, uh, he switches gears. And the Christian is going to learn a spiritual walk that is rooted in his spiritual well. That's in chapters 4 through 6. But before we get to chapter 4, uh, in chapter 3, our scripture reading, in verse number 20, uh, we find a marvelous statement uh, that affirms the awesome power of God. Paul says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. We think about this statement and this statement follows a series of monumental prayer requests that was uh, just uttered by the Apostle Paul in verses 16 uh, through 19. We think about what he prays for there. He prays that the saints might be strengthened by the Spirit of God in the inner man. Uh, he prays that they uh, might 
allowed Jesus to dwell in their hearts by or through faith. He prays that they might be rooted and grounded in love, that they might comprehend with all the saints the dimensions and come to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He prays that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, you think about that prayer request, and someone may say that seems pretty ambitious. Can God really do all of that for man? That's something to think about. Because you and I, we often have the problem, if you will, of expecting things of others, of asking things of others that are simply unreasonable. Asking things and expecting things that they are simply unable to do. I think about a mother uh, who has lost her son, and she begs the preacher uh, to bring her baby back. And no matter how sincere she is in her pleading, uh, no matter how much that uh, preacher uh, would love to ease her pain, no matter how much he wishes he could bring her baby back, you see, he's just not able to do it. That is beyond him. That young man is dead, and he's not coming back on this on this side. You think about those who are suffering from terminal illnesses. They're sick and they're dying. And they are asking the doctor for a cure. And more times than not, regardless of how sincere that plea may be, regardless of the desire that that doctor has to heal, often it is the case there is no cure. You see, they're asking things of that doctor, asking things of that preacher that are simply beyond their ability to fulfill. Now we think about that and we go back to Ephesians 3. And the Apostle Paul wants these Christians to understand some things after he makes these requests of God. Uh, he wants to impress upon their minds, yes, these prayer requests, if you will, are far reaching. Yes, these requests are humanly impossible. But he wants them to understand that in the reality of who God is, God is able. He has the ability. He has the power. He has the intellectual magnitude. He has the resources to not only offer and to fulfill these petitions, but to go exceedingly above and beyond. All that you ask or think. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. But it does not mean it does not mean that when we call on God, he's going to give us everything that we ask for or everything that we can conjure up in our minds. That's not what it means. Because you see, sometimes we ask for things that are simply not good for us, that are simply not uh, for the best. You remember when Jesus was preaching in Matthew chapter seven, uh, verses seven through 11, what we refer to as that sermon on the mount. Remember that? And remember what he says there in verse 7, he says, ask and what? Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks, receive. Everyone who seeks or to the one who seeks, it shall, he shall find. And to the one who knocks, it shall be opened. But he goes on and he says, which of you, if your son, if your child asks for a loaf, you won't give him a stone, will you? If they ask for a fish, you certainly won't give them a serpent, will you? Verse 11 is the punchline. He says, since you are, if you as evil men, sinful individuals, fleshly, know how to give good gifts to your children, certainly won't God give good things, good things to those who ask him. I'm saying to you that sometimes we're asking for God. Asking God of things or for things that are simply not good. They're not for our best. I'm saying to you, sometimes we're asking and we're thinking of things that are simply not in accordance to God's will. First John 5, 13 through 14. Right. And so it doesn't mean that God is going to give us whatever we ask for. I think. But here's what it should impress upon our minds, though. That we are never in danger. We should never worry about the magnitude of our asking or thinking. We should never think or worry about those things exceeding 
God's ability. Let me say that again. We have no need to worry about our petitions or our thinking ever outpacing God's magnificent ability. Now, that is important because I want you to think about your prayer life. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the word of God tells us to be anxious about nothing. But in everything with prayer and supplications, make your requests made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. The Bible tells us to worry or to be anxious about nothing, but to pray about everything. And I'm saying to you, when you go to God in prayer, are you mindful that he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you ask or think? I'm saying to you that some of us, the problem may not be that we're asking for too much. Maybe we're asking for too little. We're approaching God in prayer as if he's limited like one of us, as if he's limited like a human being. I'm saying to you, we'd be better off approaching him the way Jeremiah did in chapter 32 and verse 17. Where Jeremiah says, ah, oh, Lord. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Listen to him. Nothing, nothing is too hard for you. Do you have that attitude when you know that the throne of God's grace? I'm saying to you that maybe well, the danger is not us asking for too much. We're praying what we're asking for is too small. You think about your thinking. What do you believe is possible for you in Christ? Elders, deacons, preachers, what do, how big is our thinking? How big is our vision as we think about what we can accomplish here for the Lord? You ever think about that? I'm saying to you the problem may be that we're thinking too small and not casting a vision and not thinking about what God can do. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly more. More. Think about yourself as a husband and a father, a wife, a mother. What are you thinking is possible for you in that role and possible for you and your family? What can you accomplish for the Lord? I'm saying far too often we are thinking far too small. Our thoughts and our petitions are often not worthy of the God we serve. I'm saying to you, as Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion, that there are some things that are impossible with man that are possible with God. We read about one of those things in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, we could say that the Apostle Paul, uh, he likens the church to a body. Uh, he'll help us to understand that the church is the body of Christ, the fullness of Christ. Uh, in Christ is where all the spiritual blessings are. Uh, and in verses 1 through 14, he helps us to understand that the entire Godhead uh, was involved in the creation uh, of this body, of the church. Uh, and verses 1 through 6, uh, he will help us to see specifically verses 3 through 6 that it was planned. This body was planned by God. Uh, in verses 7 through 12, he will help us to see uh, it was planned by the Father, excuse me. In verses 7 through 12, he will help us to see that it was purchased by the Son. And then in verses 13 through 14, he will help us to see that it is preserved by the Holy Spirit. But we want to jump down to verse 15 for the sake of time. The Apostle Paul is getting ready to express thanksgiving, and he's going to mention that he's praying for these saints. He's praying for something on their behalf. I want us to note it. He says, therefore, in verse number 15, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, 
that the eyes of your understanding being lightened, that you may know some things. He says, I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of your understanding be illuminated, that you can know, that you can understand some things. He's going to list three things. He says that you may understand or that you may know what is, number one, the hope of his calling. Number two, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And then thirdly, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? Now, all three of those things are very intriguing, but I want us to focus on the third, the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Now, what type of power is Paul talking about? I mean, what's the nature? What's the scope of this power? I'm so glad that you asked. Because he helps us to understand if we just keep reading, keep reading. At the end of verse 19, he says, uh, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe this power is in accordance to the working of his mighty power, which worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Someone says, what's the point, brother preacher? Here's the point. Paul says the power. Uh, that is working the exceeding and the incredible and the immeasurable power uh, that is working towards believers is in accordance. It's the same power that was that work that worked in Christ when God raised him from the dead, uh, when God seated Christ at his right hand, uh, when he exalted him to that esteemed position, putting all things in subjection under his feet. That same power that raised the Lord, that's the same power that's being exercised towards those who believe. Now we ask, you got to let that sink in just a little bit. Let that sink in for a little bit. That the power that raised a crucified man that brought a crucified man back to life, uh, that raised them to the highest position possible in the universe, that same power, the power that subjected all things in heaven and earth under his authority, that same power has been manifested towards those who believe. Now, how is that? How is that? Someone says, well, well, I... I I haven't been raised from the dead. You sure about that? Someone says, I'm not sitting in the heavenly places. Maybe not, but are you sure about that? Because we think about how this power is exercised, and then when we come into chapter number two, uh, the Apostle Paul helps us to understand some things about God's awesome power in conversion. Chapter two and verse number one, what does he say? But you were dead in trespasses and sins. They were dead. And then he goes on in verse number three, because they were dead in those trespasses and sins, what did that mean for them? He said that they were living their lives according to the course of this world. He talks about the fact that they were being guided and living under the influence of Satan. That's verse two. Verse three, he talks about the fact that they were living their lives according to their own fleshly lusts and worldly passions. The latter part of verse three, he makes it clear that they were under God's wrath. Verse 12, you look at that, he helps them to understand that they were separated from God, separated from Christ, without hope and without God. I'm saying to you, they were dead. I'm saying to you, before you became a Christian, guess what you were, spiritually speaking? Dead. But God. Verse 4. 
but God. They were dead in their sins, in their trespasses. But what did God do but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us? God loved us. But not only did he love us, you look at verse number five and we'll see he liberated us. Because it says in verse five, even when we were dead in trespasses, what did God do? He made us alive together with Christ. I'm telling you, by grace, you have been saved. We were dead. He made us alive again in Christ. He loved us. He liberated us. And I know you see it in verse number six. He lifted us. He says, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places. Where? In Christ. He says to them, you were dead. God brought you back to spiritual life in Christ. And he's giving you a seat with him, spiritually speaking, in the heavenlies, the heavenly realm, in Christ. I'm saying to you that the same power that brought Jesus back to life after he'd been crucified, the same power uh, that exalted him to the right hand of God and put all things under his authority. That's the same power, the same power uh, that gives us, that has given us, and raised us to spiritual life, raised us from spiritual death, I should say. It's the same power that gives us new life, spiritually speaking. It's that same power that has given us an exalted position. We've said, we sung that song. Do you really know what that means? I walk with the king. Do you really see if you knew what that really means and you think about these verses, you'd be excited. You wouldn't be asleep. If you knew what it meant about walking with the king and having that exalted position as a kingdom citizen in Christ. Oh, you'd be excited about that. You'd be excited. I am with the king. You see, it took divine power to raise Jesus from the dead, and it took divine power to raise us from our spiritual death, if you will. It took divine creative power. Because remember what he says in chapter 2 and verse number 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. My goodness. For good works. So this does something for me. So what does that mean? Let me bring it on home to you. <laughs> what does that mean? That the same power that uh, was exercised in raising Christ from the dead, that same power is exercised towards every person uh, who obeys the gospel. Right. It's that power that gives them new life, uh, allows them to be a new creature made new in Christ. And so that uh, paints an awesome picture for us as we think about what God is able to do. Perhaps one of the greatest illustrations of God's ability and power can be summed up in the phrase that God is able to save sinners. He's able to save the sinful and the loss, that's a powerful statement because we think about the condition of mankind without Christ. The condition of mankind without Christ. Individuals are wandering through this life lost with no aim, no direction, seeking peace, but can find none. Condemned to an eternity separated from God. Many individuals without Christ living their lives according to their own selfish passions and desires in complete rebellion to everything that's pure and holy. You think about your life before you became a Christian. And I'm saying to you, what was hopeless 
has become or can become hope filled because of God's ability to save. John 3, 16 and 17 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, verse 17 tells us, but that the world through him might be saved. I'm saying to you, God's great love and concern for sinful humanity led him to formulate a plan that made the impossible possible. that he had the power, the intellectual capacity, and the resources to not only formulate, but to execute a great scheme of redemption in which all humanity has the ability, the possibility to be saved. As we think about what God is able to do, as the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 7 and verse 25, you see, he's able to save to the uttermost. The Hebrews writer says that God is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him through Christ. He's able to save them completely and forever and for all times. And I don't care. I'm going to be excited about it because I know that what that means for me. I know what that means for you. I know what that means for the, the homosexual. I know what that means for the pedophile and the rapist. I know what that means for that individual who is abuser, an abuser of women and children, for that individual who is a womanizer. I know what that means for the person whom you think is the scum of the earth, that they can be saved if they'll come to God. They can be saved. God's able to save them. He's able to save them. And not only can he save them, you know what else God can do with them? Oh, he can use them in a mighty way. I'm saying to you, he can use you. I don't care about what your past was. I don't care what people may say. As I said on Wednesday, I'll say it today. Never forget about what God can do with the chief of sinners. You open your Bible up to 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 12 through 16. Maybe you want to note it. Uh, Notated in your notes, but never forget about what God can do with the chief of sinners. Because you look at that passage. In verse 15, uh, Paul says, uh, this is a faithful saying, and it's worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, I'm the chief. I'm the foremost. What do you mean by that, Paul? Back up a couple of verses. He says, man, I was a blasphemer. I spoke against Christ and his cause uh, with all the energy I had. He said, I persecuted that way to the death. I was an insolent man consenting to these Christians being murdered. But he's so grateful. Because in verse 12, we're in spite of his shortcomings, in spite of his past, he says, I'm grateful that God has strengthened me. He has enabled me. He's judged me faithful. He's appointed me to his service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm grateful that God is able to save to the uttermost. And no matter where you come from, if you come to Jesus, he can save you. He'll wipe you clean. And all the things he can do with you. He took the apostle Paul, that murderer and persecutor of the church, and turned him into one of the greatest gospel preachers and teachers this world has ever seen. What can he do for you or with you and through you? Lastly, as we close, and I've got to say this. I've got to say this. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 
He's able to help those who are tempted. Somebody needs this, so I'm going to say that. He's able to help those who are tempted. In Hebrews 2, uh, verses 17 and 18, as the Hebrews writer is talking about Jesus and his, him being our high priest, he says, uh, therefore, in all aspects, he had to be made like his brothers, human beings, uh, that he might be a faithful, a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, making propitiation for uh, the people. Because he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able, he's able to succor, to aid, to help those who are tempted. Somebody said amen, please. Appreciate you. <laughs> he's able to help those who are tempted. Think about that, and I promise you I'll sit down after this. Jesus took on flesh and blood. He knows what it's like to be human. Jesus suffered the cruel, agonizing death of the cross. Jesus knows what it's like to do battles, if you will, with Satan. He was tempted by Satan, Matthew 4. He understands. He can sympathize. The Bible tells us so in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, our iniquities. But in all points, he was tempted as we are, and yet without sin. No wonder the Bible says that God is able to make a way of escape when the time of temptation comes, because Jesus has been there. He's overcome temptation. I think about it like this. You watch some of those movies uh, when there's a particular uh, prison uh, and it's, they say it's impossible to break out, right? And maybe Clint Eastwood or Arnold Schwarzenegger, somehow they, they break out of this uh, maximum security uh, prison for the first time. And because they break out of it, they make a way for others to escape after them. I'm saying that's like temptation with Jesus. You think about it as a prison, and the entire human race has succumbed to it and been led into sin. But King Jesus, although he was tempted, he did not sin. And he has provided a way for you and I to escape that prison of temptation. If we'll take the way of escape that he provides, maybe you're struggling with pornography. Maybe you're struggling with alcoholism. Maybe you're struggling with some sexual sin. You know, maybe, and I, I take this upon myself for, for not being as responsible as I should, maybe you're dealing with same-sex attraction. You know, often there are many people who agree with what the Bible says, that homosexuality is a sin. They know that, but they struggle with same-sex attraction. They struggle with that. And I would be ignorant to not believe that, to believe no one in this audience suffers with same-sex attraction. I'm not saying it makes sense. I'm saying that if that is your struggle, if that is a temptation that calls you, God is able to help you overcome that temptation. That's what I'm saying. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the gift of the present. We just pray that you help us to be good stewards of all that you've entrusted to us. Just pray that you help us to walk with you. We're so grateful for it your ability to save. And we just pray that you'll help us to always submit to your guidelines, your commandments, uh, that salvation in Christ might be ours, that we might walk with you through this life and into the next. For we love you, we praise you.
It's in Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, uh, God is able to save you. And if he can save you right now, uh, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, uh, that he died on Calvary's cross, he was buried, and rose again on the third day. Do you believe that gospel message? Are you willing to repent of your past sins? Acts 2.38. Are you willing to confess that wonderful name of Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, he is the Son of God, and are you willing to uh, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus told them to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believes and is baptized, they'll be saved. You can obey that right now. All things are ready. Uh, if you're in Christ, and we can pray for you or assist you in any way with, in your walk with the King. Uh, please come forward as we stand uh, and as we sing.